Welcome to another edition of My Not Matters here at The Dakota and brought to you by Shock Safe and Lock. Today we are in Fire Station 5, the newest fire station in town. I'm really excited about this. We're actually joined by Alan Dostert, who is with EAPC Architects and Engineers. Um, and they actually had a huge part in making sure that this fire station was actually able to come to life. So first off, thank you for joining us today, Alan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we jump into the fire station and all the work that I'm sure it took to make this happen, tell us a little bit about you. Well, uh, I grew up just west of Minot. I grew up on a dairy farm about 20 miles west of here. Went to high school in Berthold, North Dakota. And so growing up, Minot was always the place we came for shopping and entertainment and all those sort of things. Right. So Minot's always felt like home. Very cool. Very cool. At what age or when did you realize that architect and engineering was going to be your thing? Well, on the farm, we built all of our own buildings and right. we modeled a lot of old barns and stuff like that. And my dad was a pretty accomplished carpenter in his own right. And that always intrigued me. And uh, at yeah. a pretty young age, I was committed to uh, going into the architecture program, like okay. seventh and eighth grade. Wow. Very young. Very young. So you, you've been the president CEO since, I believe, 2005? Correct. But what, what was it like to be around Alan when he was in high school? Who, who, who was Alan back then? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, a pretty good student, probably. Yeah. Uh, not as good a kid. I, I got good grades, but probably yeah. misbehaved a little too much. But yeah. That's pretty typical, you that's know. Uh, but you know, I was a, I was involved in a lot of things, and and that involvement with a lot of different activities and meeting a lot of people it was a right. good tool to uh, carry over into what I do today. Absolutely, connections and uh, networks are very important. So. EAPC is not new to Minot. You guys have a rich history here in Minot. Yes. Um, you guys have been very invested in the community. So let's kind of look at some of the projects that you guys have had a part in. We could go through some in the healthcare, education, uh, civil sectors, um, and the, the fire stations. Um, I have it listed fire station two, three, four, the new fire station five. You've been part of the Maverick by Epic. Uh, you've helped with the Milton Young Towers and other housing projects. What are some of the projects that stand out to you? Well, there's a collection of projects at Minot State that we're, we're very proud of. We uh, originally did the, the all-weather field, and we okay. followed that up with the stadium seating. And then we did the press box, but all while that, that was being done, we also did the wellness center. And so okay. it's a collection of our work in a real tight area there on the Minot State campus. And we're pretty proud of that work. Right. That's fantastic. I've been in that wellness center. It's fantastic. It, it, it's beautiful. Okay. Much like the kitchen behind me. <laughs> very fantastic. <laughs> so... Um, very neat. Uh, you really enjoyed the Minot State. How, how was it putting together a fire station? It seems very unique and you guys have done a lot. Yeah, we've done a lot. Um, learned, you know, the first fire station I ever did uh, was a long time ago with another firm. And basically we were just taking the orders of the people, you know, who occupied and, uh, and operated the, the fire station. And as I learned more about fire station design, fire stations in particular, there's a lot more to it than just putting okay. a big garage next to a house. I mean, right. There's a lot more to it. And a lot of, there's a lot of firms and a lot of people who do fire stations, and we really make it our business to do them right. Right. And by doing them right, it means you know, uh, really managing the uh, contaminants that they bring from a site back okay. to the station such as this, and how we, how we keep that out of these spaces, how we keep it out of their living quarters, because they're here 24-7. Right. And uh, you and I may visit and walk through the apparatus bay or, or crawl into one of the uh, engines or something. We're exposed to it for a couple of minutes. Right. But this is where they live. Yeah. And so we have to be very careful about those contaminants that come from the site. Yeah, that makes sense. That's very different. Um, what is it like, the, the back and forth, I'm sure, working with, in, with the city or in, with whomever you get to work with, working with the different fire chiefs? Um, what, what's that, that uh, conglomerate like? Well, every state every department has you know, usually they have several stations and every department whether it be in any of the major cities they have yeah. career stations there's a lot of stations we do that are also uh, um, you know they're volunteer stations so people drive to that That's station different. they don't live there right but we've done station work in all the major cities mm -hmm. in north dakota and outside of north dakota uh, and they're called career stations where they live and work in the station itself and every department has its own culture. Okay. And that's one of the real key things is tying into that culture. And of course, the leadership, you know, the, the fire chief and battalion chiefs and so forth, they kind of lead that culture. And uh, I've, I've seen that culture ebb and flow, you know, as I've worked with one department over a period of years when, when the leadership is coming on. And, uh, you know, they, the thing you can count on the firefighters and the fire departments, they have our interests in the public right up front. That's the first thing. That's incredible. So, 
you know, I've always, we always use this sort of moniker that we're very proud to yeah. protect those who protect us. Right. And doing a station correctly means protecting the people who live here. It's exactly that, right? So, um, you were very uh, much involved when 2011, when out of somewhere, uh, we had a major flood that hit Minot and affected a lot of families and a lot of people. Um, you guys evaluated, I have it as over 5,000 homes right. in 10 days. Uh, you stayed at your father's farm. It was, you were displaced. There, there was a lot of things going on. Yeah. What, for you, I know everybody has their own personal story to this. For you though, what, what was that experience like? Well, having gone through the flood in Grand Forks, I lived in Grand Forks when, when that flood happened. And uh, it, some people say, well, wherever Alan moves, uh, be careful. I <laughs> uh, moved down to Fargo and had a house in Moorhead. And of course, we had the weather flood down there as well. Wow. Uh, now, I didn't move to, wasn't living in mine at the time that uh, in 2011. Okay. Um, but the numbers at that time were like 5,000 houses were touched by the water. Right. 500 had, you know, damage of some kind. 50 were pretty bad and five were like really, really, really bad. Right. And so uh, the goal was to get those uh, initial assessment for safety purposes. You know, was the power on, power off? Was the gas turned on or off? Was, right. the, was there pets or were the things abandoned? What, what, mm -hmm. What's the structural status of the building? So there's just a number of things that we had in a checklist that we went through that we went, uh, we had to inspect these buildings and we had a two week time frame to do it. And at that time, CJ Craven was the fire chief and okay. we're working directly under him wow. uh, and uh, working with the city on that and we we said they came to us and said can you get it done in two weeks uh, hmm. <laughs> okay we've done a lot of that I mean, we right. did a lot of it in grand forks of course when that happened and uh, we worked very hard to prepare separate teams you know what we ended yeah. up with five separate teams to accomplish the work um, one team was basically led by myself and we stayed at my dad's place. My wow. dad's farm became like a bed and breakfast. Nice. There you go. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is as we went through after those 10 days was over, he was kind of like, well, are you guys coming back? <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> I think he kind of enjoyed the, <laughs> right. the uh, you know, the presence of people around and the activity yeah. and, and people, uh, you know, kind of talking to him and, and keeping him company as well. But right. so we had a group that kind of stayed out at the, uh, what was in kind of the FEMA park, the FEMA yeah. trailers. Uh, we had a group that commuted up from Bismarck because we have an office in Bismarck as well. And uh, then we had a group of people here in town that were not affected by the flood. Okay. So we, and we also outsourced one of the team of structural engineers uh, okay. who helped us a lot too. So we had five teams attacking us and we worked from light to light every day. And we wow. would just uh, go down a city block and take a look at every building. And we had sort of a checklist of things and, yeah. and we got through them. But very was, taxing. Probably communication was important. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, we all wore these really gross green colored shirts so we could pick each other up. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah so that's important. Other, hey, there's John over there. Let's go get him. You know? e exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, it's interesting, though, you mentioned your, your dad's farm, Brett and Beck, was he missing you when it's gone? And it seems like that's characteristic of mine out right there. Uh, just opening the doors, whatever. And I know that's Berthel, that's the, that's, but I mean, greater Minot area, perhaps they probably wouldn't like that. But the point is, um, that's Minot. That's opening doors, making people feel comfortable. We have the Who's Fest coming up, um, and that's what people are going to do. Yeah. They'll open their doors, invite people, and stay with us while you go. You know, you're from Norway. Stay with us while you go visit the Who's. Really neat. I think it's part of the Midwest culture as well. Yeah. But you know, mine it really exemplifies that. I mean, in, in times of especially tragic crisis or things like that, it just seems to to just get that much more amplified in terms of the, the ability for people to reach out and support each other. And right. We saw a lot. Yeah, that's very neat. What were some of the, I, it's a very difficult time that uh, Minot was going through, but what were some of the high points for you guys? What were some things that really stood out to you? Well, we got close to the end. I mean, we're, there was a big question that we're going to get done. Yeah. And when we did get it done, there was uh, there was a lot of people who teamed up with us, and there was tears and all kinds of things happening. It was just like a wow. big celebration when we that's got neat. it done. But you, know, you have to be sympathetic to those folks. I mean, here we're walking through their property, right. and they're trying to put their lives back into place. Yes. I haven't gone through that myself. Uh, you have a pretty good empathy for what they're feeling and what they're going through. Right. And it's it's pretty dramatic you yeah. know, to lose a home and have no control whatsoever, but then to try to rebuild and get your life back into place. And there's these people inspecting your house and looking at it. Is it safe? Is it not? Is it going to get a red tag? Is it not? All those sort of things. Just that uncertainty and that unknown peace gave people a lot of angst. And part of our job, quite frankly, was to kind of be a counselor as we went, you know, and to keep people... Yeah as it were, off the ledge so that they didn't get 
you know, really upset by the process because the process was there to help them. Right. Not to take any property away or condemn any property. Right. Just to make sure that nobody got hurt. That understanding is really important. Absolutely. Um, what were some of the things you've probably seen in your team as well? You, you have these teams all over the state, it sounds like a little bit, coming together. What, what were some of the neat things you saw from that? Well, the, I, the, the stories of the guys staying out with my dad, I mean, they pitched in That's to do stuff around. Yeah. He was having a mini flood of his own oh, no. out there at the farm. That farm that farmhouse was built in 76 and they okay. had a drop of water in the basement. And that, wow. that during yep. that event, right. all of a sudden water started coming in the basement. So That's crazy. we had our own issues and, and so people pitched in and helped out with that as well. Yeah, very neat. So. You guys at EAPC, probably one of the big things you guys have to do is problem solving. Like yes, that's absolutely. that's the business right that's there. What we do, yeah. That's what you do. So, what's what is your guys' unique approach to that? How, how do you guys approach problem solving versus a different company in town or, or however? Well, I, I, it goes back to my education. I can't speak for absolutely everyone in our, yeah. in our office, but a lot of us were educated through the architectural program, anyways, through NDSU. And NDSU is not the biggest architectural program in the world. Right. But they taught us how to be critical thinkers. And That's important. Solvers. And a big part of that is when we go out and we're working for people like the city and working with fire departments and doing buildings like this, yeah. the big thing is bringing expertise to the table, but don't be heavy handed. You have to listen. Right. And I think that's probably our calling card is that we listen very, very well and we give people options. Mm -hmm. We don't say, well, this is how you do it. You know, this is how it's got to be done. Here's what the experts tell us. You'll right. never hear those kind of words from us. It's like, well, here's some options. Yeah. Like, here's how we solve that situation. Here's how we can approach it. And we kind of gently get people into that mindset where um, the solution becomes pretty apparent once right. you start talking about it. And you're not really telling them what to do. They're participating in the process of deciding what to do. Right. That's, that's important. And that's really important. It to is. To make people feel good about yeah. what they're doing moving forward. So many times people are just put in a box. Uh, this is the solution. Jump in. And it, it's not enjoyable. You see a lot of people really fighting that right now. Um, you mentioned NDSU is a huge part of, well, a, a large part simply because that's where a lot of the education for you employees perhaps happen. Something interesting that NDSU recently produced was their their deal of the Minot downtown area. Are you familiar with that at all? Absolutely. Okay. So do you have any thoughts on that? I know that's kind of off the cuff there. I Well, I actually got called into a couple of studios to okay. critique and to help them with some of the... Uh, some of the thoughts and you know some of the things that the downtown's faced with for instance is how do you deal with the uh, the trinity buildings right you know, as they move into the new facility and how can they be readapted and and how does that urban fabric changed by those people not being downtown anymore and so i was involved i was asked to be a guest critique on a number of projects and of okay. course i got a pretty good um pretty good knowledge of mine yeah and, absolutely and good so i was i felt pretty qualified to sit down and talk to the students about right you know what they were doing and things that made sense and maybe things that were you know there's nothing wrong with being outside the box right but it also needs to be contextualized with what's happening in Minot. absolutely yeah. yeah has to be applicable in some yep. way yep very neat it'll be cool if some of those things do come into place um for those students and also for the city of minot yeah. Um, so one of the things that's very important to EAPC is your guys' impact on community, being involved in the community um, and things like that. What, what are some of the uh, positive effects on local culture and community that you guys have seen from the projects that you have done or from your guys' outreach, however that has formulated? Well, there's three types of projects we do a lot of. I mean, we have, we, being in North Dakota, you're a generalist and you do everything from A to Z. There's no question about yeah. that. But we have some specialty sectors. Uh, we do a lot of the fire station right. components are in what we call our civic sector, and that okay. includes fire stations and police stations. And we're currently working with the Minot Police Department right now doing a study for their facility. Very cool. uh, we have a sector for, uh, for health care. And then one thing that really kind of falls into a number of different sectors, the other sectors would be K-12 okay. education, higher education, and then we do a uh, real heavy um, in, uh, process engineering and, and industrial engineering. But we do wellness centers, like we okay. did for Minot State. We right. do a, a number of those. And sometimes they can be health center based, sometimes it can be higher education, and sometimes they're just community based. But health centers and fire stations, police stations, and working in hospitals and clinics, um, I like to think that a lot of what we do mm -hmm. is, again, helping people who help us. Right. And that's pretty gratifying yeah. to know that you're making a difference right. in their work 
area because they're work areas nowadays. You know, you're, where you work is a tool to get your work done. Yeah. And so you can't just look at it as well. That just happens. You know, we rent this space or we live in this space or whatever. It you know nowadays your spaces are high tech environments to help you accomplish right. what your goal is. And Absolutely. so we take that very seriously, and we're very proud that we can help people with that. So you guys are, I, we've already touched on a little bit, but fire stations, you mentioned again, how did it come about, about that your company began to be able to focus on that? Because this is something you guys do in Fargo. This is not just a Minot thing here. I, I've just done some numbers. You know, we've got, uh, I've done over 20 fire stations the last four or five years. Wow. Probably 30 stations overall in wow. my, lately here in my career. Mostly um, in North Dakota or even beyond? Mostly in North Dakota. Yeah. Our firm has done, you know, in South Dakota, Minnesota as well. Okay. Um, and we, in the again, knowing the fire department's culture is so important yeah. because once you gain their trust, and the fire departments, they all know each other and they can talk and right. they do talk all the time. So if you mess up and yeah. you don't listen or you don't do a good job for them, you're kind of out real quick. You right, know, that word travels pretty fast, but it also travels when you work hard and you gain their trust and you do what you need to do to make their world safe. Right, uh, that word travels as well and well, so that word of mouth between fire chiefs has really helped us to do you know we don't just do one off usually when we do a fire station it may be our second or third or even fourth project and sometimes wow. even fifth or sixth project yeah. in a given city that's incredible and so uh, yeah we take it real serious so that uh, we get invited back because yeah. it's a, a big part of our work right absolutely that's very neat what, what is it like you, you you get done with the fire station you come back into it like today and i'm sure you've done that with many of your other ones what is it like to see it completed and, and what's that feeling well it's really you know that's one of the big parts of architecture or construction or engineering yeah. um you know seeing that the gratification of what you did right what you accomplished but for me one of the really great days was when they had the grand opening here right we helped um, host some tours and a lot of the people who came through were neighborhood people wow people who were you know just living across the street yep. or just you know, within a block or so, and a lot of those people have watched this happen over the last year or so, yeah. and we're anticipating it happening for a couple of years because it got delayed a little bit in its start, and now they can't got to be able to come here and see what it was all about, right. and it was really interesting to hear the comments that came from them, and, and part of the, the, the tour was to talk to them about why we do some of the things we do inside a building like this in terms of protecting the fire firefighters from the contaminants and, and the, you know, the first responder syndrome and all those sort of things that right. kind of come with their job. Mm -hmm. And it, it um, it's kind of a two-way street. You communicate to the neighbors and they become that much better neighbors. I mean, right. I think, That's I think big. the fire station is a great neighbor for the people around here. They'll, Absolutely. They will take care of this property. They'll lend a hand. They'll be here if anyone needs mm -hmm. help. Uh, and likewise, I think the neighborhood now, knowing what they have here, will be a very, uh, well, they won't hesitate to come in and say hi, folks. Right. Would be, would be my guess. And that's important. That's important. Um, what, what, you, you've been at this for a long time. Um, a while. A while. Yeah, maybe not a long time, a while. How, with, how many years? I've been with the APC for 33 years. 33 years. And I've been doing this, uh, I, I started my first year in college. It's a five-year program mm -hmm. at NDSU. My first year in college, I went to work uh, part-time during school for, uh, Seth Twitchell Associates, and they were a right. accomplished design firm. Yep. But then in the summers, I always came back to Minot. And the okay. very first year, I was successful in landing a job with what was then Warner Construction out of Minot. Yeah. And people asked me, so if you know a lot about architecture and construction, where'd you learn it? And I'm like, <laughs> I have to say, this is not to knock my uh, friends at NDSU whatsoever, because I'm on their advisory yeah. board as well. Right. But I learned 51% of what I know from working with contractors. Wow, wow. And, and I would just, you know, that's the one thing I would tell any young person who wants to get in engineering or architecture of the trades is get a job with a contractor and you'll learn so much. Right. Wow. You, you, the hands on is just it's, yeah, it can't always, be always. Replaced. Right. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I think I think that's really good advice right there. So 33 years doing this. What's one of the most coolest projects the, the capstone project that you look back in your career like that that was a good one to work capstone to. project i'm still waiting for it you're no. still waiting for it yeah <laughs> we we've uh, got a very significant project right now one of the biggest projects in the firm and it's certainly the biggest project i've been involved with and i've done some pretty good sized projects we did a, a significant hospital project in cape Girardeau, Missouri. okay um, Missouri. and we did it was a cancer and a heart center and that was a close to 100 million. And we're doing a project for NDSU, which is approaching that kind of size as well. It's the biggest project NDSU has done to date. Wow. And it's called the Peltier Complex. Okay. And it's ag, yep. uh, agriculture sciences in the foods and cereal, cereal crops and, and okay. uh, 
meat industry. Right. That's got to be neat being able to go back to, you know, your alma mater and be able to go and do some work there. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, we haven't done a lot of work there, but this one project is a very significant one. So it kind of, yeah. it's very fun to be able to say, right. yeah, that's, that's something we did. We did their health and wellness center on campus okay. as well. Very cool. Very cool. So we, we kind of talked about a little bit just now, but what are some of the other upcoming projects that you guys have that, you, that you're pretty excited about? Well, we have a lot of healthcare projects. Uh, we've expanded our market into Phoenix. And okay. we've, we've had an office in St. Paul for quite some time now, and both our St. Paul and our Phoenix office are really going gangbusters in the healthcare world. Yeah. And uh, healthcare is just, uh, for us, it's just growing exponentially. Um, from doing small clinic and fit outs, you know, like radiology, mm -hmm. imaging, and those sort of things, to doing entire facilities. And it's, that part is becoming a real, real excitement for us because it's growing so fast for us. Makes sense. I, I got to say, it's kind of interesting. There's another company I saw recently expanded to Phoenix that was in the Minot area. I'm like, interesting. We know what you guys want. You just want to be able to go to the, uh, for work, be able to go to Phoenix now during the uh, winter. I get asked that question all the time. You know, I've, I communicate with people in Phoenix all the time. <laughs> yeah. But I've only been in Phoenix since we opened the office three times. Oh, man. And I've got to improve. Yeah, <laughs> you've, got, you've got a good winter coming up that you can have an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. So we've talked about a lot. Um, let's talk about leadership for a minute. Uh, sure. That's definitely important when you're the CEO of a company, president of a company. Um, so what, what are some of the things that you try to implement in leadership when you're leading your team? Well, there's certain things that I, some people have asked me, so you treat your employees pretty well. And uh, I don't want to knock any of my past em employers. Right. But, you know, someone said, well, what's the recipe? What's the secret sauce? And I go, well, I remember back when I was starting out. Yeah. And those things that happened to me that were really irritating that my boss did. It was like, why don't you do that? You know, what, what, what is the deal there? Right. And I just don't do those. Yeah. And I treat people the way I want to be treated. But it, beyond that, our whole firm has a sense of sort of service uh, leadership. And I mean, I heard a story about Peter Eisner when he was the CEO at Disney. Mm -hmm. And they're doing an interview and they stopped in the middle of the interview and he ran across the path and he grabbed this bag that was blown across the okay. yard. And right. said, don't you have people that take care of that? Yeah. It's everyone's job. Right. To take that's care big. Of, us, of, of where we are. And I, I really think that's a, a great example. And that's kind of the example that we use. Uh, the other day I was walking into the office and there was a bunch of trash outside the door and two of my employees kind of stepped over it. And I thought, I was a little disappointed, but I thought, right. well, here's an opportunity. So yep. I, I picked it up and I hauled it in. And, and uh, sometimes we'll have a snowfall and two or three inches of snow sitting oh, there. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll come into the office and you know four or five people have already come to the office and it's not shoveled. And I'm like, hmm. What's going on? And I'll grab a shovel. And, no problem. I'll shovel not it. Some people say, why are you doing that? You need to get up there and get, you know, do things that the CEO would do, right? And right. Like, well, this needs to be done. Absolutely. And it seems like if I do it kind of that first snowfall of the year, I usually don't have to do it after that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the big key. But no, I think that is important. You see that with employers that are making their employees do the work and they never fully involve themselves into it and it creates some yeah. disconnect there. I would never ask an employee to do something I'm not willing to do. If right. that means long hours or that means difficult work or that mm -hmm. means things that are not quite... Uh, you know, in the mainstream, again, I would never have an employee ever expect them to do something that I'm not willing to do just immediately. So. Right. That's very good. Fantastic. Well, we're coming to a close here, but is there anything, any parting shots of wisdom that you have for us or, or anything like that? that well, uh, there's a big thing that's coming up in, in architecture and engineering and in society, quite frankly, and it's AI, artificial intelligence. Right. I just came from a conference and... Uh, um, it can scare you. And the actual artificial intelligence doesn't scare me. What scares me is the fact that it's happening so fast. Right. And it's a technology that's going to just unfold unbelievable speed. And I'm concerned that we're not in front of the curve as far mm -hmm. as we need to be. So it's something we're going to focus on in the near future. But we still are, are going to continue to focus our strategic planning of our growth of our firm. And that's just part of it, you know, working through all the technology and those sort of things. But we have a very, uh, a very uh, staunch uh, sort of structure to our strategic mm -hmm. planning. And I really look forward to that growth over the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. AI is something that is definitely very interesting. It's on the minds of a lot of people yeah. as they see it implemented in different ways. What, what ways do you see it impacting your, your industry? Well, the repetitive things that we do, writing right. reports, writing specs, uh, filling out forms, all those sort of things, it's just going to be simple. Yeah. It's just going to happen. Right. Okay, that's a, just kind of a given. Yep. But we've always been using it. There's a couple of uh, young designers in our firm and myself. We, we look at 
looking at uh, image generation okay. uh, and some of the, the preliminary things you can come up with. Now, it can't substitute the knowledge base can't. that someone who's you know, licensed and trained as an architect. You said 49% from NDSU, 51% hands-on training, right? right? It doesn't have the 51%. Exactly. And so it'll augment. It'll augment. The things it'll allow us to do is, is to do quick turnaround on those things that are tedious. So mm -hmm. we can spend more time on creative pieces and really uh, resolving sort of the difficult issues, the difficult questions, and spending more time on those things. Right. Very, very interesting. It, it will be interesting to see how it impacts everything as a whole. But also, and I know I said we we're coming to a close, but a couple more things are generating here. Um, you said your young guys in the office are, are using this. What kind of space do you give as a leader, do you give to your young guys to be able to do stuff like that, to experiment in different areas? It's something we need to be concerned about as a firm, and any business does, because of what uploads may happen to the web. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's all public. And if it's, if it's private domain things, your trade secrets, if you will, or right. your procedures, you have to be careful about yeah. you know, where that goes, right. because it can go everywhere. For sure. Uh, and you also have to be careful about what the data sets are that you're using that are generating the things that it's good because everyone, you know, the old adage that, well, if it's on the internet, it's true. Right. Well, <laughs> that's what Abraham Lincoln said. Is the same thing. <laughs> right. Abraham Lincoln said that, yeah. Uh, it, artificial intelligence is the same thing. It's only as good as the data sets it's working from. Right. It can come across and look just as legitimate as can be. Mm -hmm. And that's where people like myself and others have to sit down and say, stop. Right. That, that's not stop. it. Stop. That's yeah. not right. <laughs> right. And and you have to intercede and say, okay, here's, you know, they, they call it the prompts. You have to have the right prompts right. for it to give you the right answer. Yeah. You, so you have to train it. Garbage oh. in, garbage out. Yep. You know? Absolutely. Very good. Well, I really do appreciate you taking time um, to be on this podcast with us. Um, really excited to see, well, really, it's been great just being in this firehouse, fire station, and excited to see some of the projects that EAPC will be having in the future that you guys are working on. Um, so thank you for that. Um, also want to thank our listeners for tuning in to another episode of My Not Matters here at the Dakota and brought to you by Shock Safe and Lock. My name is Jonathan Starr. It's been a fun time. Please, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it. Subscribe to our channel on face on YouTube and uh, stop by mydakota.com. Subscribe to the email list. Stay in touch with us. We got some great things going on. Thanks and have a great day. Today I am joined by Chief Kelly with Minot Fire. What an honor. We're in Fire Station 5. Yes. This is one of the newest fire stations in town. Very cool. But before we jump in and talk about what that experience was like getting this together, first off, let's talk about you. What what is it that you do every single day? What, what is the role of a fire chief in Minot? Well, um, I kind of uh, oversee everything. Yes. Um, everything, you know, at the end of the day, everything is is overseen by me and the buck stops with me, I yeah. guess. But I have an amazing team that works with me that does all the work. So That's that's the best way to have it set up yes. when, when you're overseeing things. How many fire stations are you over? Five. Five. Yep. So, so this is the this is the uh, cherry on top, I guess, num number five right here that we're in today. Absolutely. When I got here, I I opened station four right when okay. I got here, and uh, this is this is the fifth. Very neat. Very neat. What is it? What are some of the things that you really love about your job? My team. Um, yeah. Getting to see everything that they get to do every day and the impact that they have on our community. The, right. Uh, I get to hear you know all the great stories, and I get to get the thank you letters and you right. Know, it's certainly the team. Yeah, that's very neat. Team is definitely important, I'm sure, especially with the, what you guys do. This mm -hmm. isn't an individual game. This is a team sport, as they it say. Uh, yep, for sure. Uh, um, you've been in fire for over, over 20 years, I believe? 27. 27 years. Yeah. That's incredible. A long time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very neat. Um, what are some of the stories that stand out I, I mean, to you over, over that time, especially when you're leading your team? Um, you know, uh, the, the stories, you know, I was on the trucks for 15 years and then I had the opportunity to come off the trucks and work directly for the fire chief in Grand Forks for five years before I had the opportunity to come here. Um, so there's a lot of stories. Um, things have changed. Right. I'm sure <laughs> we were just talking about that with someone else. Yeah, it's just, you know, everything is changing and, and um, the technology is so right. different. I feel kind of out of touch sometimes when they're talking to me about things. Yeah. I'm like, right. wow, things have changed. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully for the better. Yeah. Typically technology helps. but to make us safer. So yeah, right. Thing, That's so. important. That's important. So 
we're here, I've mentioned already, but we're here in Fire Station 5. This is the newest one. It was just, uh, I believe the open house or the official opening was in August, around there. Uh, Am I way off? I'm trying to think of when it was. We're in, we're in September now. I, I thought it was August, but maybe it was September. It was some it's, it's been a last two months. <laughs> yes. It's happened <laughs> it's in the last, last couple month. months. Um, and what, what was that process like getting to, you, you said you did Fire Station 4 too, but, but working with, in this case, EAPC uh, to help make on the architectural and the engineering side. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people that you guys had to work with in order to make this happen. What, what was that experience like? Um, it was a great experience. Um, I've worked with the EAPC even back in Grand Forks. Okay. Um, so I, they were, you know, known to us. They're, they've become friends, and and uh, so that's always a nice thing. Right. I mean, they understand you, and you understand them. Um, I bought the land actually in 2017. Wow. And I put a big sign up and squatted here, so yeah. no one forgot that we were coming. <laughs> um, but we, it's been a long process. Right. Um, I hired EAPC to do it back then too. Um, and we ended up doing a remodel of one of our other stations first and okay. then, um, eventually we had enough funding to be right. able to do this. And That's very neat. So it's been a long process but um, you know we've kind of tweaked things over time and I'm sure Alan right. talked about all the different um, things that go into a fire station. Yeah. Um, it's it looks like a house, but it, there's really some really cool things. It's not just he said it's not just a house with a garage two two stall garage on the yes. it's more than that. It is more than that. And so um, it's kind of evolved over the last few years, but um, I think I might be one away from making a perfect fire station, okay. but we'll see. <laughs> one <laughs> this more. Is pretty close. Yeah, this is pretty close. <laughs> yes. So you did you you were involved in fire station four. What what year did that open? 2016. 2016. I came right as it was getting ready to right. open, and okay. so I kind of wrapped up the construction. And, and, then, and then you said, I want to do this, because yeah. you bought land right away, 2017. <laughs> yeah. Put my own one up. <laughs> right. So, what was some of the just be on the tail end of that? What was some of the experience that you were able to draw from that? And be like, hey, probably want to do this differently, or I really liked how this was done. Um, you know, you learn things. I was I was actually finishing opening a station five in Grand Forks okay. when I left. Right. They were about two months away from opening that station, and I was part of that project um, from from the beginning. Right. Um, so I took a lot of things that actually, if you looked at the fire station there and looked at this one, there's okay. a lot of things that I modeled off of. Okay. Um, the things about uh, station four is it was done by different administration. They have different needs Absolutely. and likes. And, and um, I actually interviewed everybody that works out there and you know what do you like about this what do you don't like about it and I went right. to all the stations and asked the same thing and we try to get it as you know as as good of a feel for mm -hmm. the firefighters but yet fit the neighborhood that was a big thing I mean, yeah a big for sure. industrial looking building is not going to fit here <laughs> no so not at all to look like a home um, so it's just kind of, you know, it kind of yeah. depends on where you're at and, right. and what you're building. So. How much, you said that you sat down with a lot of the firefighters, um, how much say or, or, or collaboration was there with the firefighters that were going to be stationed here as well? Well, um, we didn't know who was going to be stationed here, okay. so I took a good mix of people, yep. um, male and female, older, younger, right. um, and said, what do you like? What do you, you know, what would you want in a fire station? How big should we have the exercise room? Because yep. You know that makes a difference, right? And it looked nice. Yes, it does. And um, so it was kind of a big collaboration, right? You know, the, the biggest thing that they don't like about this station actually is that I only have one fridge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but a family of four doesn't need four fridges. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So. That would be a lot. <laughs> yeah. So that's funny though. Um, for you, any secret uh, air rooms or anything like that that you built in here, uh, that, that you had included in here? Is there some secret thing that you really like about this firehouse? Um, that's kind of like an off the wall question, but you know, you get to a new home and you're like, oh yeah, the storage room underneath the stairs, like there's, you go in that little cubby hole and it's really cool. So what's one of the like little intricate, intricacies um, about this place that's kind of neat. I like the training area out in the, gra in the garage area. Yeah. Um, that's integrated in. I wish we could do more of that. Right. Um, because of our winters and, and yeah. being able to do some hands-on training in, in t inside is a really big thing for us. I wish we could, um, I would like to brainstorm and do more of that. Right. To add more little details into those kinds of things. I yeah. guess that would be my... Yeah, no, that's thing. great. Yeah, the training area. That's that's big for the uh, line of work that that people that are living in here are yeah, doing. So, sure. 
Well, appreciate you coming on. Anything that you want to just just add add about the firehouse, about working on this and all that? Um, I guess I would just like to thank the community for yeah. the support. I right. mean, it was an amazing day when we had the open house and how many community members and neighbors came over and welcomed right. us. And it was just, it, we feel so at home here already. That's so. good. Have you gotten a lot of great, you said there, but overall, I'm sure you guys do some work in the community. Have you gotten a lot of great feedback from, from the residents and stuff like that about being excited for the firehouse being here? Yes. So many have said we've, you know, we watched it for the past year being yeah. built and it's right. and we want to see it now. And right. So, and that it fits so well into the community and to the, mm -hmm. to the neighborhood. Um, the fact that it looks smaller than it actually is. Right. Yeah. Um, that was designed that way. Wow. I don't know if you talked about that, but I didn't want this over right thing I and mean, we actually built it to, okay to kind of tuck in to the side of the right you know that's very neat hill, so it looks a little smaller yeah that's so, good yeah yeah i'll say um this is a little bit different but going to the community our church we do something for the first responders every year and uh we we showed up to the fire station on north hill at after hours and we're buzzed and we're like or we called them we called them we're like hey we're at your door we got cookies <laughs> You guys want some cookies? And they went, they opened up the, the garage door for us and my, I have a two-year-old, they let him go mess around in the truck a little bit and it's really a neat thing. It's something that he probably won't remember because he's two years old, but obviously I do and we'll remember that. So really thank you guys for what you guys do and for being so accepting of the community and, and being a part of that, so. Thank you. I'm great. glad you came here, so yes. this is great. Awesome. So thank you for watching this episode of Mind Not Matters here at The Dakota and brought to you by Shock, Safe & Lock. I'm Jonathan Starr. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it, subscribe to us on YouTube, go to mydakota.com, stop by the email, drop it in, put in your email and get uh, stay up to date with all our latest content that we have coming your way. Thanks and have a great day.